Good evening. This is John Milburn for Laws 12059 Conveyancing. We're into week nine. Now, last week, we were speaking about buyers having access to the property before settlement. And at law, there is no implied right for a buyer to do it. But of course, as we typically do in conveyancing, we look to the contract as the first point of call. That's unusual because usually I say, have a look at the legislation, but in conveyancing, have a look at the contract first. 8.2 allows the buyer to access the property for certain things. Now, we're up to case 11. Rachel's joined us. Hi, Rachel. Um, so case 11. Now, you understand um, that these cases are things that I've just created. They're not in Moodle. They're purely a Zoom matter. And it's fair to say that you'd probably want to pay attention to these cases when it comes to the examination, the um, take home exam. All right, so this is case 11. We've got 15 in total for the, for the unit. Two scenarios here. The first scenario is this, you act for a buyer of a residential house. Your client agrees for a pre-settlement inspection. The buyer says to you, the seller has removed some fixtures. The agent and the seller deny this is the case. What can you do as the buyer? And what could you have done had you anticipated this situation? We've only got a small group, but let's see if we can come up with some ideas. Do you just say, that's it? Leonie says, check the contract, yes. Make sure there's, um, <coughs> uh, like, dishwasher and things like that are written into the contracting um, inclusions, you know, yes. so that anything like that is left at the property and if it's taken out, there's no dispute. Absolutely. So I guess in a way, one of the things that we could have done at the outset, if we saw the client, is make sure that you're aware of what it is that you are getting with the contract and make sure it's written into the contract. Is there anything else that you could have done at the time of entering into the contract? Are there any practical suggestions that you could give to a client who comes to you before they sign the contract to avoid this type of situation occurring. Number one, include in the contract everything that you expect the buyer to receive at settlement. That's, that's good advice. But what if you have a situation where the agent simply says, well, it wasn't there anyway. What I'm getting at is some sort of evidentiary tool Photographs, Leone got it, check the photos. And sometimes you can say, well, if you have an inspection, take a photo, a photo, take a camera or a video camera with you. That's some great evidence that you've got. Might seem a bit rude, say it's, you know, for some other reason perhaps, but that's the sort of practical thing you might do. Now, if in the situation where it's actually happened and your client is with you and we're about to settle the next day and they say things have been taken, um, the remote control, or you know, the, um, uh, the the motor for the electronic, for, you know, for the garage doors is gone. And I've had all all sorts of things have gone uh, alleged to have gone missing. What do you do? Well, you look at the contract, and you see if it's something that is included specifically. But there are a list of things that are intended to go with the sale, aren't there? Curtains, light fittings, blinds, tracks, fixed television antennas. Um, in-ground shrubs, I, I, I used to be able to rattle off the list, but it's in the contract. So you need to know that um, provision. Another thing that you can do is to settle but reserve rights. It's very dangerous to tender settlement for less than the full amount, particularly if, if it's in dispute. So if you've determined that the value of the things that have been taken that should have been there are is $5,000, you might be tempted to say, well, I'm taking 5,000 off the check. Here's what I'm gonna give you at settlement. The vendor may say, I'm refusing that tender. I'm now terminating the contract based on your bre uh, breach of the contract. And your buyer may come to you and say, well, that was great advice. Now I've lost the property. 
I'm up for legal fees, I'm up for mortgage fees, um, I've lost the deposit and I'm being threatened to be sued. So what you are better doing is to pay the full amount, tender the full amount, but specifically reserve your right uh, to pursue these matters after um, settlement um, in those circumstances. Now, I think there were a few other comments came up on the chat facility. <clears throat> so Bronwyn said, you can say you won't authorise the release of deposit after settlement pending resolution. Yes, you can put the deposit into dispute. Um, that's an argument, that's a, a possibility as well. Now let's take another slightly different scenario. You act for a young couple, they've bought their first home. A week after the contract is signed, but before the finance is approved, they take their parents through the home to give them a look at what they've bought. Would you encourage them to do that? And why is that? The answer, no. Are the parents guarantors? Perhaps from a practical perspective, the parents might have an interest in it that way. It's part of the access allowance, says Sarah. You only get one shot at the uh, inspection, so don't use it until the last moment. The ideal time, I think, to do the inspection is on the day of settlement, as close to the time of settlement as you can. All right, let's, look, let's move on to week eight material, contractor completion. I appreciate this is week nine, so I'm almost neatly one week behind. The reading material for this week, that is week eight material, is chapters six and seven of your excellent textbook. Now, you're all aware of PEXA. You're aware that um, there is a guarantee now from PEXA. As at the 29th of June this year, there is a guarantee in relation to settlements which is, I'm sure, a response to the things that we discussed in week one of this unit. If you look at the Queensland Law Society website, I won't share that with you now, but you will see that some reference to the guarantee. The guarantee applies to the sale of residential property, only residential property, where the seller's funds are misdirected after the seller's practitioner has entered the wrong, um, has entered the correct bank account details into the PEXA platform. There is a $2 million cap and there are some exclusions. You recall when we were talking about ins instalment contracts, some of the difficulties, the practical difficulties that arise on the day of settlement, which cause people to be in default. Here we have a situation where there's some guarantee from PEXA, $2 million. That's news as from the 29th of June this year. Now, there are some we're talking about now the contract to completion, the nuts and bolts, if you like, of the conveyancing process. As I mentioned to you at the start, I'm not going into the forms. I'm not going to show you a transfer or mortgage and teach you how to prepare those things. The best place to look for that, Roman and Sarah might tell me if this is correct, I would have thought would be the land title practice manual. Good resource. So if you want to know how to complete the forms, have a look at that resource. But I'm more interested in the terms of the contract. So have a look at clause 8.3 of the standard contract and you'll see that there's an obligation on the seller to use the property reasonably pending settlement. The seller must use the property reasonably until settlement. The seller must not do anything regarding the property or tenancies that may significantly alter them or result in later expense to the buyer. So the, the seller can't trash the place. Got to use it reasonably. Clause 5.2 of the contract imposes the obligation on the buyer to prepare the transfer document. So the buyer prepares the transfer document, sends them to the seller, asks the seller to sign, and typically will ask for the transfers to be returned on giving an undertaking not to use them for any purpose other than payment of transfer duty, or if you like, stamp duty to use the old terminology. The buyer may require the seller to, to do that or meet at the titles office, at the Office of State Revenue rather, to pay for the duty that needs to be paid. Now, if you're acting for a seller and you are dealing with a self-represented buyer, your buyer provides you with the transfer documents and says, please return them to me 
for stamping purposes pending settlement. Do you do that? Bronwyn yeah. knows the answer. <laughs> no. No way. Absolutely not. Now, why is that? Isn't that unfair? You'll willingly hand it back to another solicitor, but you won't give it to a person who's not a solicitor. It's a very elitist attitude, isn't it? So I could just go and lodge it and lodge the transfer if you give it back signed by the seller and not pay the money. So there's a risk there because they're not a solicitor giving an undertaking. Ah, right. So both Rachel and Bronwyn have raised this issue of undertaking. Let's assume that you now the buyer that you're dealing with, you know, used to work at a solicitor's office, they know what it's all about and they say, I will give you an undertaking, just like the undertaking that a solicitor would give you. Does that change your mind? Still no, says Bronwyn. So are we talking about the quality of the undertaking? Are we saying that the undertaking from the solicitor is better than the undertaking from a self-represented buyer? Is that the key issue? What, the solicitor's got to uh, abide by the ethical rules and that if they provide an undertaking, it's, you know, if they don't abide by it, it's a big breach of their ethical rules. So. Yes. So I think you're on the right track absolutely there. The undertaking by the solicitor um, doesn't necessarily mean, although in practice it does, that you trust them more. You do actually trust them more because you know them and they're going to be around the next day and the next week. There, are, there would be a minute number of exceptions, but basically there's that stability and there's that ongoing practice. So there is that, that builds trust. But secondly, there's a huge ramification to the solicitor who breaches the undertaking, which is not going to affect a self-represented party. So for those reasons, you don't return the transfer to the buyer self-represented for the purpose of transfer or paying the uh, duty. Now, the transfers these days um, lodged for electronic um, settlement. If you're complying with, uh, if you're engaged in that electronic process, so have a look at clause 11.2 and you'll note that um, there's an obligation on the parties that participate in this regime of electronic settlements to do so in accordance with the electronic conveyancing national law. What is the electronic conveyancing national law? Can anyone tell me? I'm sure it's in 11.2. I'm just having trouble finding it, but it's in there somewhere. All right, so what is this electronic national law? Anyone come across it? Where do you think we'd find something about it within the contract? No? All right. Let's have a go to a website. I will show you this one. I'll share it with you. And I'll give you the um, site reference. So it's 11.7, Leonie. I was looking at 11.2. I think it's, I, I've just... No, that's the definition is 11.7. Oh, it's, the definition is 11.7. Thank you. Of course, there it is. That's the definition. I was looking for it in the wrong place, so I tricked myself. Thank you for finding that. So the definition for clause 11 is 11.7, and you'll see there the um, uh, material in relation to electronic conveyancing national law, which is abbreviated to ECNL. All right, so what is this ECNL? I'll share the screen and give you a website to look at. The Electronic Conveyancing National Law through the Australian Registrar's National Electronic Conveyancing Council the website address is www.arnecc.gov.au and you'll go to the regulation tab. From there, you'll see the links to the various state legislation 
that have implemented the national law regarding electronic conveyancing. The Queensland version proclaimed on the 17th of May 2013. I'll stop the share. So do have a look at that provision for more detail about the process. Let's talk for a moment about caveats and priority notices. Now we know that priority notices used to be known as settlement notices. Settlement notices, yeah. All right, but priority notices these days. Um, you know the um, piece of legislation we consider when talking about caveats and priority notices, the Land Title Act. Part 7, Division 2 deals with caveats and Part 7A deals with priority notices. In Queenslanders, and please correct me if you believe I'm wrong, conveyances do not, as a matter of course, lodge caveats, but often, when acting for buyers, lodge priority notices. In your text, Table 6.1 on page 335, is a comparison of caveats and settlement notices or priority notices as we now know them. They're still called settlement notices in the text. Prior to the introduction of priority notices, it was not common even then for buyers to lodge caveats before settlement. The idea of the priority notice was, if you like, for want of a better term, a light caveat. It doesn't have the same penetrating effect of a caveat, but it serves a similar purpose in that it is intended to stop the registration of instruments that are contrary to that which is claimed by the person lodging the caveat or more likely the priority notice. Now, have a look, if you're looking at in this in a bit more detail, have a look at section 178 of the Land Title Act. You'll see there that registered instruments have priority in accordance with when they're lodged, not according to when they're executed. The priority rules regarding registration of instruments deals with that situation, but priority notices and caveats are not instruments. And you cannot assume that priority is determined by reference to the date a caveat is registered. A caveat, as I said, is not an instrument, and the authority for that is have a look at Schedule 6 of the Property Law Act. So it's very confusing that you've got to look at two pieces of legislation to come to that conclusion. Those of you doing land law would have realised that was a substantial part of the second question in the first assessment. Right, apportionment of outgoings. When you um, settle, you make some arrangements for apportioning rates and outgoings, not capital expenditure. So when we talk about outgoings, refer to clause 1.1, and it's basically rates and charges on the land, but not land tax. We used to apportion land tax in the old days. It led to some interesting calculations, but we don't do that any longer. The key is when the um, obligation for payment occurs, typically the settlement will occur somewhere during a three month period, for example, and it's a matter of doing some adjustments. Refer to clause 2.6 of the standard contract, where the seller is liable for outgoings up to and including the settlement date, including the settlement date, then the buyer takes over. Let's have a look at case number 12. This is 12 of 15 for the, for the, for the unit. Again, two scenarios. So thinking caps on. If you're watching this as a recorded session, please ensure that you don't gloss over these cases. When I announce there's a case, pay particular attention, stop the recording, try to work it out, look at the contract, consider statutory provisions, and jot down some notes. First scenario, you act for a seller. Your seller brings an unpaid rates notice to you. You note that the date for early discount is after the settlement date. You recommend to your client to pay the rates before settlement or to adjust on the basis that they are unpaid. Which way would you go? Are there any issues to consider? 
any thoughts? There's no right or wrong answer with this, by the way. Bondman says, I'd pay the discount. Pay it. Aren't you providing a benefit then to the buyer? Sarah says, the issue is if they're unpaid, they will adjust on the full amount without the discount. Exactly. I agree with both of you. I think generally speaking, pay the rates, obtain the benefit of the discount, even though to some degree you're providing a benefit to the buyer. You're still going to adjust on the discounted amount, but at least your client gets to share in that discount. Now, it may be that if the um, billing cycle is such that you're only one day in, there's really no benefit to the seller. So thinking of it selfishly from the seller's perspective, maybe it's not worth the bother. But theoretically, better to pay now. Both parties get to share in that um, benefit. What if the rates notice comes to you the day before settlement or it's due the, ne you know, it's due the next day? Would you still do that? Or is there a point where you say, look, it's just too late. We'll just go with the gross amount rather than the net amount. Bronwood says, no, it's not too late. Leonie says, you can go with the unpaid. Again, there's no right or wrong answer there. But the idea is that if you have that um, as a question, still adjust on the unpaid. Yep. <clears throat> then um, just be aware of some of those issues. Second scenario within the same case. 12. You act for a seller. The buyer asks for an extension of one week. You obtain instructions from your client and says, yeah, sure, that's fine, no problem. You advise the buyer accordingly. Have you inadvertently, now let's assume that you extended the contract and you said time remains of the essence. Have you inadvertently overlooked some issues relevant to the um, best interests of the buyer or the seller? You're acting for the seller, so we'll look at it from the seller's perspective. Finance? Maybe. Outgoings, Rachel says. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. I'm getting at the outgoings. So <clears throat> Sarah says you'd adjust from the original date of settlement so the seller gets the maximum benefit. Yeah. If um, you extend by one week, be aware that your client has to pay for that amount of the outgoings. So not only are they missing out on their money, but they also have to pay the outgoings for an extra week. So one thing that you could do, which I think is fairly common, is to say, yes, we grant you the extension, but we will adjust the outgoings as at the date of the original intended settlement. People normally accept that. Another thing you could do, is um, Sarah's put the, the thing up on the screen that I wanted to see. You could also charge default interest. Yes, we grant you the extension, but we do so on the basis that rates are adjusted as at the original date and your client pay default interest. Maybe it's one or either, potentially, but in theory, there's no reason why you can't do both. Um, so how do we work out the default interest rate? If we say, all right, we can, we'll settle later, but you've got to pay interest on the one week. And you might think, oh, that's a bit petty, but it can actually and it can add up depending on how much the transaction is. So as per the Queensland Law Society default contract interest rate, says Sarah, and I agree with that. Are you bound by that? Let's take this scenario. Again, this is still within number 11. You're, you're, um, the buyer asks for an extension of a week and you say, all right, we want rates adjusted as at the date of original settlement. We want default interest, but we want default interest at the rate of 10% or say 15%, not the QLS rate. Are you allowed to do that? Well, let's go further and say, we'll give you the extension, but we want all of those things and we want you to pay an extra $2,000. Cover our legal fees and a few other things. Can you do that? I 
I think you can, but you've got to be careful. I think the um, it's a variation with consideration, says Rachel. Yep, I agree with that. So um, when you're in that situation, you don't have much time and you've got to understand that the the whole thing can be is very can be potentially volatile. In other words, don't make assumptions either way when you're acting for a buyer or a seller. Things can change quickly and there's nothing in the contract that says that this is the way it must be in the event of a successful extension. It's still a renegotiation. Rachel says very wisely, put it in writing, absolutely. Make sure that you add, or add that provision, time to remain of the essence. You've got to do that. Okay, so there's no rule that describes it must be um, one way or the other, but standard practice would be to add the Queensland Law Society default interest rate, I think would be the standard acceptable practice. The only says, does the $2,000 that you might ask for on top change the purchase price? Maybe it does. Maybe that has some other implications. For example, if your property is subject to capital gains tax, maybe your client is up for an extra bit of tax. Maybe the buyer has to pay an extra bit of transfer duty, Bronwyn's got it, because of the change in the consideration. So there are a few issues that come into play here. Again, there's no right or wrong answer to this, but um, it depends perhaps on how you frame the um, how you frame the extension. I would think that if it's framed on the basis that the the two thousand dollars is buying time, it's not increasing the price. That's a justifiable position to take, but you've got to be careful how you word it. Now, just on land tax, we mentioned that as not something that's adjusted, but be aware that the Land Tax Act Section 7 says that liability for land tax for a financial year arises at midnight on the 30 June immediately preceding, preceding the financial year. So it kind of works retrospectively. We used to see that in the contract. What was the rateable value of the land as at 30 June immediately preceding the financial year? Don't have to worry about that too much now. Okay, let's talk about time of the essence. Clause 6.1 of the contract says time is of the essence. Does that mean that if the parties agree to a settlement at a certain location on a certain date at 3 p.m. and the buyer is late and hasn't arrived by 10 past three, that the seller can say, um, I'm here ready to tender and make a big song and dance of it. I'm here, I'm ready to tender, I'm ready, willing and able. Get some witnesses to verify that fact. And then at 10 past three, leave the premises only to find that the buyer arrives at quarter past three. Can the buyer terminate the contract because the seller, sorry, can the seller terminate the contract because the buyer was late by 15 minutes? No, 6.1. When I started, you could. When I started, three o'clock time of the essence meant three o'clock time of the essence. But there was um, some case law about that and the contract has now been changed. So that when we talk about time of the essence, that excludes the time of day. Does that exclude the time of day for all conditions or just the condition about settlement? It's only settlement, isn't it? Only settlement. So if you have some other time in the contract, um, say 5 p.m. for example, on a date for finance or building and pest, that, that means still 5 p.m. You recall when we talked about instalment contracts, we talked about issues to do with time of the essence and the ability to terminate contracts. Just as a reminder, we'll go through a few cases. Anwar Enterprises against Couchy, C-A-U-C-H-I. 2003-217-CLR-315. By way of reminder, in that case, Tanwa, the buyer, entered into a contract to buy three properties from Couchy, the seller. Some problems on the settlement day. The money was stuck in Singapore. The buyer 
didn't really do anything wrong, just couldn't get the money. It was just stuck. Time was of the essence. The buyer did not attend settlement. The seller terminated the contract. The buyer had the funds available the next day and said the next day, I'm ready, I'm willing, and I'm able to effect settlement. The High Court held in that case that it was not unconscionable of the seller to terminate the contract when they did. So that's authority for the proposition that when we talk about time being of the essence, we really mean it. Not the time of day, but the date. Another decision, Caprice Property Holdings against Maclay and others, or another, 2013 Queensland Court of Appeal 125. Contract specified the place for settlement as the Gold Coast, nominated 3pm for settlement. The buyer failed to settle by 5pm. Seller sent a facsimile asserting the buyer had fundamentally breached the contract and sent that fax at 4.36 p.m. on that day. The seller was entitled to terminate the contract and could have terminated but chose to proceed and the Court of Appeal confirmed the primary judge's decision to order specific performance and forfeiture of the deposit. So again, another decision, time of the essence means time of the essence. Land Bank Tanana against Mackay, 2006 Queensland Supreme Court, 55, time of the essence. Purchase price, $800,000, deposit $75,000. Subject to development approval, the buyer had spent $191,000 between contract and before settlement in trying to get this development approval through. The seller said, that's fine, but you do so at your own risk. Settlement was nominated for Caloundra. There were a few extensions. At 4.38 on the Friday before the settlement, the buyer requested a further extension and offered an increase of $10,000. Um, at 5.10, the seller solicitor said, client's away, can't get any instructions um, other than to request settlement as per the contract on the Monday. On Monday, the solicitor said, no, our client is not prepared to extend. We have in the past, but we're not going to do it again. The buyer, perhaps assuming that the extension would be granted, was then in trouble and the buyer started to make arrangements for the transfer of the funds at about 11.30 a.m. that morning. You'd think that would be enough time, but it wasn't. The money went into the buyer solicitor's trust account. The buyer solicitors had to send the money down to an unpaid agent. Um, and all of it just took too long. 5.07 p.m. on the Monday, the seller solicitors said contracts terminated. Held, the buyer failed to settle. The sellers could lawfully terminate the contract. Again, following that theme, time does mean of the essence. And the final case, again, all of these are cases that I referred to in the context of instalment contracts, but I'm looking at them from a different perspective now of the time of the essence issue. The final case, Jefferson's Road against D. Dominico, 2005, Queensland Supreme Court 66. Time of the essence, buyer financier sent funds through to a local firm for settlement. The, went into the wrong account, went into the solicitor's old trust account. In the end, the buyer was just not ready because of that technical hitch. The court said, once again, contract properly terminated by the sellers, the deposit was indeed forfeited. And I made the comment previously, I'll make it again. It's really a case of saying, irrespective of a good reason, basically saying it's almost there are no good reasons. Um, the money is due, get it there, get it to the seller on the day. If not, the seller has the right to terminate the contract. That's the strong conclusion, I think, that you can bring from, draw from those cases. And it even applies in circumstances where the buyer has spent considerable time, considerable expense, even if the land has increased significantly in value, for example, in Tanwa, 
where the buyers obtain development approval, the, the, buyers, the sellers can still terminate the contract. All right. Have a look at Property Law Act, Section 61, that deals with conditions of sale. And it says, where in a contract for the sale of land, the date for payment is to be ascertained by reference to a period of time expiring on a Saturday or a Sunday or public holiday, then unless the contract designates um, such day, the, the settlement will occur on the days may be agreed or in default on a day other than the Saturday, Sunday or public holiday next following the contract date. So that's the property law act. Um, just a quick plug for environmental law. I do um, take environmental law in third year and um, in there um, we deal with specialist searches that we're not going to deal with in this unit. Things like the Environmental Protection Agency, special aspects of um, town planning certificates and administrative notices. So just be aware that there are a whole range of inspections and um, searches that the buyer can undertake in this period contract through to settlement. Just to refer you to a, a case briefly, it's a recent decision. This is Intensia, I-N-T-E-N-S-I-A, Proprietary Limited against Nichols Constructions, Proprietary Limited. It's 2018 QCA 191. And this is um, a case to do with contracts and the interpretation of contracts. What happened is the parties contracted for the sale of land and it was held at first instant, the termination of the contract was not justified. So it went on appeal. Um, have a look in, in the context of this case, Intensia, have a look at clause 7.3 Sorry, 7.4, subsection 3A. You'll see the um, warranty to do with the Environmental Protection Act. The seller warrants that, except as disclosed in the contract or a notice given by the seller to the buyer under the EPA, there are no outstanding obligations on the seller to give notice to the administering authority under the Environmental Protection Act. Now, it was held in this case, and if you're looking at the case, look at paragraphs 53 to through to 55. That's all you need to do. The seller knew from the approval of its application for demolition of the building in question that the buildings may contain asbestos. The seller engaged a builder to conduct, conduct the uh, demolition. The seller had no reason to suspect the builder would not engage a competent asbestos demolition expert to remove the asbestos from the dwelling. There was no evidence capable of suggesting the seller was aware of any facts or circumstances at the time it entered into the contract that could lead to the land being listed as contaminated because of that statutory process. So I just wanted to raise that case. It's a very recent case, of course, only August this year, but it does deal with section, uh, uh, sorry, 7.4 of the contract and it deals with that environmental issue. Now, this week's work, this is the, um, the content is contract through to completion. So we're now at the completion stage or settlement stage. Have a look at clause 5.3 of the standard conditions. And it calls for settlement, um, it calls for the buyer at settlement to submit payment of the balance purchase price, that is the amount which is owe, owing other than the deposit and as adjusted in accordance with the requirement to adjust outgoings. The payment of the balance price is paid in exchange for vacant possession of the property. Possession means with good title. So there's implied into the contract that vacant possession will be given at completion. Now, if the seller is not able to provide good title or vacant possession, the buyer can do a few things about it. 
Um, but wise practice would be for the buyer to tender. Now, does anyone know what tender means in the context of settlement? What do we mean by tender? Rachel says, hold back money. Ronwin says, ready, willing and able. Let it go. All right, so when I talk about tender, I think Bronwyn is the one that I'd, I'd say is the closest to what I've got in mind. Tender means this formal process, which is a little artificial perhaps, of being at the appointed time and place with the money and or the documents that you need to show that you were, you were ready to go. In other words, if you're now going to purport that the other side have failed to fulfil their obligations, the first thing you need to be... Um, you need to satisfy a court is that you are in fact ready to go and you do that by this process of tender so it's back in the old days we used to do settlements in the titles office and you would hear people at you know three o'clock or five past three and you'd hear them say um settlement in the matter of smith and jones here for smith ready to tender i am ready willing and able and you'd sort of announce it three times and you try and get a witness um, it actually happened. And so you'd, you'd, you'd find somebody to say, here, witness the fact, you'd say, hey, can you witness my tender? And you'd actually, it was very, it's very, uh, it was very, it was, it was theatrical. It was good. I don't know if we'd still do that or not. It's been a while since I've actually done conveyancing, but that's what we used to do. So some way or another, you need to show that you are in a position and you have in fact attended. Now, if the other side make it abundantly clear they're not going to attend, you probably don't need to go for, through that formality, but just be careful um, because you want to ensure that you can show you did nothing wrong. Now at settlement, we exchange documents for money. When we talk about money at settlement, we talk about the balance purchase price. How is that actually provided? People bring in a wheelbarrow full of cash, checks, Bank checks, yes, more specifically bank checks. Can it be, at least in part, a normal check, like a general check or a trust account check? No, no. What if you're acting for a buyer? Ronman says can be trust account check. What if you're acting for a, sorry, acting for a seller and your seller say, and, the, and the client says, look, at settlement, I would like $99,000 paid to my bank account, but I'm going to buy a car and I need $1,000 paid to, you know, downtown Toyota or something. Are you allowed to do that? Can you ask for a check that's not actually to you? Yep. Now, as agreed. So can you say, look, and for that little check, you don't have to give me a bank check. Uh, just a trust account check would be fine. Yep. Um, so there is the issue of number of bank checks that can be drawn, but you can waive that in certain circumstances. Now, is a bank check the same as cash? Is it as good as cash? Allegedly. Is bank check as good? Still takes time to clear. Yep. Don't lose it. Don't do what I did. I'm running down Queen Street. Have a check fly out of you. That's why PEXA is better, says Bromman. I agree with all of that. So, yes, bank checks aren't strictly cash. If you're acting for a party that is um, self-represented, one thing you could consider doing is... Um, holding up settlement until you see the bank check and contact the bank to verify that the bank did draw that check to ensure that it's not a forgery. I'm not saying that actually happens in practice, but it could do. So PEXA is going to help in terms of that practice considerably. Only registered subscribers can use PEXA. Have a look at um, figure 7.1 on page 379 of your text and you'll see some further information 
in relation to that. That's the um, flow chart, how PECS settlement process works. Quite technical, but uh, no, I haven't been involved in this process. Bronwyn, have you actually been involved in this process? Yeah, at my last job, I was um, using PECSA for settlements because they were in okay. tweak heads. So oh, right. a lot of New South Wales settlements were done that way, yes. particularly a oh, couple yeah. of Queensland ones. But it's um, once you get the hang of it, it really is very effective. And you've, you know, you just have to make sure that you verify your client's identity and do all these things to make sure that you're, you know, um, not you're doing things legally, you know, for the right people and making sure the money's going to the right accounts and what have you. All right. And does it, it all happens from a desktop? Yeah. From a computer? Yeah. Right. And you can work, work much more efficiently on the day. Like you can do, you know, it really is effective and you kind of just watch it and it goes, once you've got everything, everything lined up, um, you can just you just sort of watch it and you go, oh, well, we've settled, aren't we clever? <laughs> the That's money's good. in the account, the title's transferred immediately. It's really quite good. Excellent. So so you can actually see this process live on your computer between the time that the, the workspace locks until settlement. You can see those steps. Um, that diagram 7.1 in the text hopefully represents the real life that Bronwyn is talking about. I'm sure it does. All right, so thank you, Bronwyn, for that. Um, and the obligation on each party for electronic settlement, they're contained in um, the contract. I believe, is it clause 5.3? Documents and keys at settlement. Have a look at 5.5, .5, which deals with possession of property and title to chattels and 11.3 of the standard contract. So the combination of those various settlements together result in the seller having to provide documents in exchange for the purchase price. The workspace contains the documents, releases the encumbrances. At the time of settlement, the sellers for the solicitor and outgoing mortgagee have already provided their destination Bank accounts. <clears throat> the solicitors have complied with the escrow requirements in 11.3 regarding documents and keys and vacant possession is available. So again, have a look at um, uh, the contract. Look at clause 11.2 and 11.3 subsection 5. All of this should occur before 4 p.m even though the contract provides for settlement any time before five. Now, I know we're getting late. Um, I'm getting fairly close. I'm just going to push on a little bit, and I hope you don't mind. Let's look at case 13. Items missing, detected during a final inspection. Kind of a follow-on to an earlier one we did. You act for a buyer. They do an inspection on the day of settlement. They discover the sellers have swapped over the curtains. What do you do about that? It really, it really does follow on from the last one we did. Just as a refresher, what can you do from a practical perspective? Check the photos, yep, have a look at your evidence. And I think if you're going to settle, reserve, reserve your rights to issue proceedings in relation to that specific breach that you allege after the event. That's an easy one. Right, abandonment. I think I told, told you about this in my first settlement. Um, clause 5.6 provides that any reserved items not removed before settlement are considered abandoned. The buyer complete the contract and appropriate, appropriate those items, dispose of them any way they see fit. Let's look at a case. Re Jigros, J I G R O S E, PTYL today, 1994 1, Queensland reports at 382. This was an abandonment case. 
So there were some bales of hay worth $20,000. They were not included specifically in the property agreed to be sold under the contract. They were, however, present at the time of completion, and that's when the buyers took possession of the land. The buyers purported to keep that $20,000 worth of hay. The sellers did not like it. They brought an application to a court. They did so under Section 70 of the Property Law Act. You'll recall Section 70 is that handy provision that allows for the summary determination of matters under dispute where there's not a lot of factual issues. So it's a quick way of resolving disputes. Justice Kiefel, as um, Her Honour was at that time, referred to Clause 28 and basically said that there was nothing precluding them from asserting a right to the ownership of those items that were left behind. Her Honour said that the buyer acquired title to the chattels pursuant to Clause 28 by act of, an, by act of appropriation which constituted by manifesting an intention to exercise control over those items. Her Honour applied Parker against British Airways Board, 1982 Queen's Bench, 1004. And Her Honour found that whilst Clause 28 was not enforceable as a penalty, a court may grant a vendor relief from forfeiture um, in some circumstances. So there is a bit of wriggle room based on that case. But it's pretty similar to the case I found myself in in my first conveyance. All right, and just finally, last thing for tonight, have a look at clause 10.6 of the contract, which deals with the issue of merger. And it says that despite settlement, despite registration of the transfer, any terms of the contract that can take effect after settlement or registration remain in force. So for example, a clause requiring work to be done may survive settlement, enabling the aggrieved party to bring action. Um, or for example, if there was an error in the calculation of settlement figures and one party got away with some money, um, or maybe a party failed to undertake work that they were required to do under the contract. But as we've mentioned, as a common theme on a few things that we've said tonight, if you detect something like that before settlement, you would be prudent to reserve your right to seek compensation, even though you have tendered the full amount. And that then brings us to the end of week eight. So when we start next week, I'll only be one week behind neatly. Next week, we'll deal with special conditions. Are there any questions arising from anything we've discussed tonight? Again, you've been very patient. Thank you very much. All good? All right. Okay, thank you for attending um, and we'll see you next week. All the best. Bye then.